Hello, everyone. Welcome to eBiz Chat, where it is all about business and other things occasionally. I am Rick Zanotti, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. If you're wondering, Susan is, oh, a geologist, an economist. She is a training specialist, instructional designer, does a lot of stuff in training, a writer, prolific writer, if I may add. Uh, and who knows what else she can do? She's magical. Anyway, oh, and by the way, she is also the servant to the e-learning corgi. Now, that is, <laughs> that is a title that very few people have, and she actually has uh -huh. that title. I kid you not. Uh -huh. Go check out elearningcorgi.com. And in studio, we've got Harold Muliati, our video producer. And today, our guest is again the venerable, I like calling you venerable, <laughs> not only that, he's a good guy, Dr. Ed Stewart, who really is in charge of Scotland, but that's a whole other story. Here we go. This show is sponsored by Relate Corporation. Visit us at www.relatecasts.net. Thanks. And we are back and in that center position of power. It is Dr. Ed. How are you, Ed? Good. Great to see you, Rick. Good to see Susan. Good to listen to Harold. Nice to be here. Yeah, always good to see you. And uh, wow, it's a crazy world right now and crazy econ economics everywhere. And you mentioned yeah, pre-show yeah. Bitcoin. What is happening to Bitcoin? Yeah. You, you, you know, if I knew that, Rick. You'd um, be richer. But I think it... it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it illustrates one of the things I always tell my students, um, especially intro students at the beginning of class, at the beginning of the semester, when students come in with the idea that they're going to learn how to make money in the mm. stock market, or they're going to learn these secrets or whatever. And I always disillusion them and, and unintentionally insult them by saying, that if I knew those kinds of secrets, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on my yacht in the Mediterranean. <laughs> and then for day-to-day -day kinds of things like Bitcoin and foreign exchange prices and commodities prices, I, I always sell, say to my upper division students, better not to read Adam Smith or other economists, mm -hmm. much better to read mm -hmm. Wilhelm Reich or Freud on irrational <laughs> psychology or uh, uh, so true and and now uh, to be more serious there is a branch of economics called behavioral economics that has given uh, some recent Nobel prizes to Richard Thaler and Daniel hmm. Kahneman and mm -hmm. the whole premise of behavioral economics actually started actually by two Israeli psychologists hmm. is that surprisingly enough uh, not surprising to normal humans, but surprising to a lot of economists, a lot of people make decisions not on the basis of rational calculation, but on the basis of emotion yep. or who they've <laughs> listened to or over over optimistic or over pessimistic. So trying to pick uh, Bitcoin prices or gold prices or anything that's almost entirely speculative and psychological is um, beyond my ability because I, I'm just an economist um, and not something really difficult like a, an abnormal psychologist or uh, somebody who specializes in mental disorders, which I think is more, more of a qualification for things like Bitcoin and gold and, and, and what have you. So um, the only thing I... Uh, Oh go, oh, go ahead, Susan. Excuse me. Okay, so speaking of that, have you read Charles Mackay's um, um, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds? Hmm. So he, um, he wrote no, it in the 1800s. I've skimmed through it, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I've Mania. also, I, 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 yeah, right, right, yeah. Right now I'm actually reading a book called The Coffee Trader by a man, a writer named Daniel Liss. And it takes place in Amsterdam in 1659. And mm. sugar few and there's a the the main hero Miguel Lienzo is a Portuguese Jew who's living in Amsterdam and speculating in um, he was speculating in sugar futures and they collapse and he's bankrupt. But now he meets this woman who's discovered coffee and coffee beans, and mm. that may be the next. Um, so speaking of Julius Meinl, 
like that. Um, and one of the things I know Susan was asking last time, and Rick, you and I were discussing as well, the the beginnings of inflation and where mm -hmm. it is. And I, I brought some numbers to uh, have some fun with, but coffee bean prices are 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 going up uh, yeah. as as well. Um, but that's a little bit understandable because it, it, it's partly due to weather, partly due to, you know, all, everybody in their home office and and uh, drinking a lot more coffee to stay awake through every other uh, kind of webinar. These, your webinars, Rick, you don't need coffee because it's bright and lively and, and you know, you're a brilliant uh, webinar host, podcast host. Um, but... And I wasn't paid to say that, right? Um, but credit, um, card, credit card. So, yeah, credit card, right? <laughs> um, you can pay me in Bitcoin. How about That's that? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the and and a lot of the short-term price bubbles right now um, are kind of the beginnings of a of an economic rebound. The first quarter GDP numbers were good. Um, 6.4 percent. My forecast for second quarter uh, GDP, which will be over with in about a month and 10 days, is probably 8 to 10 to percent. Um, and there are certain things that are uh, becoming a lot more expensive quickly. Um, if you've tried to rent a car lately, um, mm -hmm. according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in the last 12 months, a car truck rental prices have gone up 82.2 percent <laughs> yeah so yeah uh and gasoline prices have gone up 49.6 percent so yeah and more in California. Uh, my other yeah my other favorite uh number is that uh bacon prices have gone up by 10 percent hmm. and cigarettes have gone up by seven percent so my my advice to everybody listening is to walk don't eat bacon, don't smoke cigarette, uh, and you'll be you'll avoid inflation and you'll do much better um, well, I thought part, I thought part of practices the advice was, for your health. I thought part of the advice was don't give pig cigarettes anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Well, here's another, but okay, so Ed, I agree with you. However, there are a couple of things I'd like to bring up. First is... Okay. The question of supply chain, we know that lumber has gone up, like say decking from $7 two years ago to now $56. Hmm. We know that potash and, um, and um, ammonium nitrate fertilizer have gone up um, at least 100% in certain cases. So are those, uh, there's a lot of elasticity upward and as soon as the supply chains um, kind of break loose and open up again, do you think that there will be elasticity downward or is it kind of stuck up there? Yes. No. You're, you're, I wish we had a whiteboard, Susan, and I could draw a price inelastic supply curve and a demand curve shifting to the to the right. Um, a lot of the lumber price and other, other commodities you, you mentioned, Susan, have to do with the fact that price elasticity of supply in the short run is is very low in in lumber there's just a lot of people in the in the lumber business who've either had covid don't want to go to work for covid uh situations um shutdowns and it's a lot and and obviously you can't grow trees overnight just because the price has gone up and you can't go out and process lumber quickly so these short-term effects are are the effect of very very um, slow supply adjustment to increases in in demand and eventually the supply curve instead of being vertical will get more and more horizontal I won't get completely horizontal but it'll get a lot flatter and therefore increases in demand <laughs> will translate into increases in quantity supplied more than increases in 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 price so it isn't part of the problem um, with, with lumber also that they're just building like crazy in some parts. Yeah, that's the other and, thing is that yeah. the demand for, and you hit the nail on the head, Rick, no construction pun intended, but right. my father was a home builder, so we hit a lot of nails on the head, right? Um, 
Yeah, and the homes that are being built, Rick, as 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 I'm sure you know, are bigger homes, right? The mm. that the the real real estate and demographic movement. There was there was something on, I think Bloomberg the other day that the people who are moving are upper income individuals, right? People who've been to some extent still employed during the pandemic and and have done well, and now can af can afford and and need. You know, another another room for an office, another room for the Peloton machine, another room for the kids to be on uh, whatever their grade school uh, internet is, and so they're moving to the near suburbs or rural areas and building five and six bedroom homes, mm -hmm. and that takes a lot of lumber and yeah. the uh, the lumber business, the construction business. Um, for a good part of the pandemic was simply either shut down or uh, operating at very, very low levels. And um, you can't just throw houses together. Like I said, my dad was a home builder. Takes two or three months to build to build a house. Yeah. Um, and that uh, that, as Susan said, that that supply increase is going to take a while. So I'm not I'm not one of these inflation. Your hair is on fire. Oh my God, the dollar is going to crash. Let's move into the gold or box tops or what have you. I I think um, the inflation. Um, I wasn't being totally facetious when I was talking about gasoline going up by forty nine percent and car and mm -hmm. truck rentals. Is that underlying inflation is still somewhere between two and three percent a year, and that's what it'll go back to, and that's what it'll be for for a long time. Um, well, you know, home, one of the reasons mortgage, why Rick and, and home mortgage rates yeah. right now are about they went up a little bit in the last I think week to from one point nine something to now it's about two point seven five. That's still incredibly yeah. low. I know, and Rick, you're nowhere near as old as I am, but I I, I can remember the good old days of the nineteen eighties when home mortgages were fifteen mm -hmm. percent, sixteen percent, seventeen percent. Do you remember um, what we had so, like nineteen yeah, twenty percent inflation back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so that's, you, you, you bring up a really good macroeconomic point, Rick, that as long as interest rates are this low and you can get a 30 year fixed, you, you also remember Rick, that back in the days of 18 and 19% inflation, you almost couldn't find a fixed rate mortgage. Everything was an ARM, was an ARM, was an adjustable rate right. mortgage. And, right. the, and the rate was only fixed for maybe six months and then mm -hmm. it might go up. Now, yeah. um, when I explain or tell my undergraduates what an adjustable rate mortgage is, they look at me like, uh, huh? what is that? But, yeah. you know, in the in the 80s and 90s, that's that's all there. That's all there was. So, yeah, yeah there's yeah. there's still a lot of one of the reasons I'm still bullish on the economy, the stock market, is that interest rates are, are still low and they're going to stay low um, for the foreseeable future um, so that all of the things that people buy with borrowed money, is there's still going to be very healthy demand. Yeah. Okay, and so that stocks, request... Oh. Stocks aren't going to crash, but there may be a few that, you know... Um, do but i think just you know the, the good old garden variety nasdaq 100 s p 500 right even the dow jones which is less and less representative of the economy or even corporate america um that there's not much else to to right yeah, susan so here's a question um so let's say a person has a house and they're saying good grief I can go 50% more than, I mean, my, my, this is crazy. I, it's like, um, let's say a house is a hundred thousand dollars and now somebody's willing to offer 150. Should they take it? Will the prices go back down in a year or so? I don't think they they'll can... go down. Not like they, not like they did in, you know, 07, 08 when house prices in places like Las Vegas and, mm, and, yeah. South Florida went from, you know, you had a $300,000 house one day and the next day you had a $100,000 house and you mm -hmm. still had a 300, actually you had a $350,000 mortgage. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, people I, just I, walked I, away I think, at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't think the 
housing there's a housing bubble i don't i don't think people should i've never thought people should buy houses for income or wealth gains you buy you buy a house because it's a nice place to live and you could see yourself living there and it's comfortable and you can afford it um i always tell my students rich people buy stock and poor people buy houses um <laughs> so yeah and that and that's true if you look at the federal reserve survey of consumer finances once you get wealth levels over about a million dollars um real estate gets a smaller and smaller share of the total wealth portfolio and hmm. equities and get to be a larger and larger um, percentage. But how about, so, how about a balanced fund like a T. Rowe Price or Morningstar where they're balanced between equities and, and bonds or whatever other things? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's what is, my, my humble opinion really old professor that's what emeritus and Rick calls me venerable because he's too nice to say he's the oldest economist i know <laughs> um but having having lived a long long time you get less and less sure of you know this is always or this is never mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean my own personal portfolio is i've got some etfs and some index funds and and I've got some bond index funds um, because I don't know. And not only do I, I know a couple of things. I know that I don't know. And I also know that nobody else does either. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to pay anybody to tell me what to do with my money. Um, and for, for people that want to know what to do about wealth, um, the best thing is just to get Burton Melchior's a random walk down Wall Street. I think it's in its 15th or 16th edition, you can get a paperback edition. You can go to the library and get it, and that's the best set of advice. And his advice is the same thing, is that you should be in a very balanced portfolio with some equities, not just U.S. domestic, but foreign and, and some bonds. And, and um, put, if you're in the, pro, if you're not, if you're a young man like Rick, who's still saving, then you put a little bit in every month and you put the same amount in every month. And so when the stock market has a bad patch like it did last week, you're buying more stock. Um, and if you're consistent and patient and you're not a trend follower or somebody who, you know, well, my hairdresser said this. I don't have a hairdresser, but my, my grandmother used to come back from the beauty salon and say, the girls, right, because she was in her 90s when she was saying this, and if you're in your 90s, you can be a girl. She said, the girls said I should be, and, and grandma was in Spokane, Washington, and grandma and, her, and the girls that she uh, played bridge with and, and went to the beauty salon, they loved uh, silver mining stocks and gold hmm. mining stock in northern Idaho and, and Montana. And she would always say, well, Eddie, this stock is only, it only costs a nickel. And I said, Grandma, it only costs a nickel, and tomorrow it's going to cost a penny, right? So, anyway. I bought some of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, fortunately, my, my grandfather, being a very astute uh, German, uh, before he passed away, he set up a very ironclad trust for my grandmother that she could not get much of the principal, and it was run by... Um, some very old conservative bankers in Spokane, Washington, and the little bit of dividend she got, she would she would buy Lucky Penny Mines and Anaconda, <laughs> whatever, and you know she had a great time with it. And almost always, they turned out to be worth nothing. Right? Mm. So, but she enjoyed the gamble, and she enjoyed watching <laughs> the prices go up and down, and much more so what? than. The, the real stock that, that my grandfather had that, that that was the basis of her income was Washington Water Power, one of those boring utility stocks that paid 6 or 7% income every single quarter, you know, for 50 or 100 years. No, no, but that's Ed, not very exciting, and you can't really, can't really talk about it. Ed, let me ask you something about hyperinflation. People, we're not even in hmm? really major inflation, but you've got a lot of... Uh, bears and 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 people freaking out going, yeah hyperinflation's on the way we're all gonna die yeah, yeah, yeah. but they do this all yeah. the time every year yeah for, for decades yeah. it's always yes. hyperinflation's coming 
These yep. people have never lived yeah. in hyperinflation. They've never seen it. They've right. never. I mean, I, I remember back in the late 70s, I lived for, for three years in a 300% hyperinflation, basically hyperinflation. Uh, in Israel, right. for example, they had 1,000% at one yeah. point hyperinflation. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. even we, when we had 20% here, it was like the end of the world for a lot that of people. That was 20%. That, yeah, and that was only 20%. That 20%. was 20% per annum. Yeah, and yeah. but it's funny. What's with all the fear-mongering about hyperinflation when we're still at 1%, 2 3%? 3%. Yeah, I think it's my analogy, Rick, and I don't know, you could correct me or maybe it's not as a good analogy, but weather forecasters love to speculate about hurricanes and typhoons mm, yeah. and tornadoes and so forth because – that's what that's what grabs people and makes fear them want to watch. Fear cells. Right? Fear cells. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the very first times I was I was with y'all, as we would say in Texas, uh, we were talking about my compar comparative economic system, capitalism versus socialism, mm -hmm. and I had lived in um, post-Soviet Russia in the in the nineties where the inflation rate was when i was there in 94 living um it was about a hundred percent a month that's a lot right? mm -hmm. um and the russian central bank wasn't a, a real a real central bank it wasn't like the fed or the ecb or the bank of england it literally was a place where they printed money right, right. that's right. what they did and they just kept printing it um thinking that they would solve inflation if they just gave people enough paper rubles mm -hmm. and yeah. eventually that that crashed as it did in argentina as it did mm -hmm. in zimbabwe um i think i probably bolivia. mentioned in bolivia in in 2001 yeah. i was teaching in salzburg and i took a trip to romania and this was before romania was in the eu and they were still dealing with the aftermath of ceausescu mm -hmm. and the exchange rate for the old Romanian Liu uh, was about 25,000 to one. Hmm. So my first night in Bucharest, when I took my, my driver out to dinner, the bill came and it was 480,000. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, this is expensive. And I realized, oh, this is $8. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's one of the things that makes the United States unique. And it, it's one of the, I think things to be proud of in our economic history is we've never had a currency uh, renunciation, right? Mm. The Soviets did it every 10 years. The, the Russian governments, the Yeltsin, Putin mm -hmm. governments have done it about every 10 years. Um, the, the Germans, right? They had the Reichmarks. They had the hyperinflation of the, of the thirties, um, and so the United States, mm -hmm. we've never we've never had that. Um, the U.S. dollar has been, especially since the founding of the Federal Reserve in 1913, it's been a fairly stable currency, which is yeah. why people around the world want to hold on to it. So well, here's, here's another. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to say one more in. thing, Susan, and I want to I want to kind of end end this this really valuable discussion that Rick is 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 leading is that for people who are who are about to get sold something because of hyperinflation don't do it right um if somebody is is selling something to you on the basis that we're you know, on the verge of hyperinflation that person is is a snake oil salesman yep. or somebody <laughs> who's just going to take your take your money um so don't don't do it right Susan? I'm so glad to hear Okay, you I just wanted that. to end that. I think, I think Rick, Rick's done yeah. a, this, if this podcast does nothing else, but I think Rick has, has, has given everybody a valuable lesson and a historical perspective is that even in the, even in the late 70s and early 80s, when the United yeah. States was at 15, 16, 17% per annum, there were people in Israel and Argentina yeah. and Yugoslavia who were saying, that's nothing. That's that's yeah. stable prices yeah, where we that's come true. from. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear okay, you Susan, say Okay, Susan, I'll, I'll shut up now. No, no, no. no I'm so, that, it's perfect because 
basically, I was going to mention that I was just about to um, invest in potash and a, a whole okay. um, warehouse of potash. And the second thing is, I was in Uzbekistan. I brought my son with me when he was 14, and they were having um, devaluation and inflation. And so we had to bring everything in, in dollars because what happened is in right. inflation, everything turned into de facto dollar. So he wanted to yeah. move or spend the whole summer in Uzbekistan because for twenty dollars, he was able to bring all of his little buddies to get pizza, go on a taxi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, right. and, but yeah, but as long as, it was as as long as you don't, as long as you don't trade all of your dollars in for whatever the local currency mm -hmm. is at 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 one time, you need to just get a little bit of the currency that you need for day-to-day -day transactions. Don't cash it all at once and, and hold and most of your smart, dollar. And you know this, the smart uh, trader in of money doesn't trade in at the formal places. They trade in the ones where you right. go downstairs, and these are all legit, yeah. but you go downstairs and yeah. they give you more money for what you have. Right. In, in Bolivia, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was there were little... Um, Chola, a woman who would, they were just basically money tra lender traders. Yep. And so they were walking exchange and I would trade money there because it changed every day. But oh, yeah. what I saw up there in, in, in Bolivia and also in Uzbekistan, everybody hoarded dollars because that was essentially the de facto currency yeah, when they were starting to be mm -hmm. crazy. Well, we are, that music signifies we've been out of time. And mm. Harold, do we have a guest for next <laughs> yeah. week? Dr. Ed, are you available next week to continue this? Because we've got some really good stuff going on. Yeah. Um, next Thursday, the twenty seventh. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. We'd love to the, have the you back on. Week after that, I'm going. I'm I'm going back to Houston for a Jesuit high school reunion. I won't tell you what number it is, but that's in two weeks, not one. That sounds, fun. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, if you if you that's don't mind great. coming back yes. next week, we can have another great conversation. This is good. Love to. You know, we always appreciate you. Anyway, well, thanks for coming on the show today, Susan, as always. And if you're watching the show, please subscribe. Give us feedback. And if you want to get a hold of Dr. Ed or anyone else, just leave some notes below. Um, and we'll, we'll relay messages. Have a good one, everyone. We That's will see great. you next week. And, and don't sell your dollars. Bye. <laughs>